Hello everyone, this is Desocrates, and in this video we're going into the history of Augustus, also known as Octavian, the first emperor of Rome. This is the first video in a series about the history of all the Roman emperors. Starting with his early life, Augustus was born in the city of Rome on the 23rd of September 63 BC, and at birth was given the name Gaius Octavius. He was also given a third name, known as a cognomen, which was Turinus. This was to celebrate his father's victory over some rebellious slaves. It's believed that the Octavian family was a distinguished family who were bankers with one member later becoming a senator. Just to note, I will be referring to him as Augustus throughout this video. In 59 BC, Augustus' father died while he was four years old. His mother then married a former governor of Syria named Lucius Marcius Philippius. The man claimed descent from Alexander the Great and had no interest in helping to raise young Augustus. Because of this, Augustus was instead raised by his grandmother Julia, the sister of Julius Caesar. Julia died in 52 or 51 BC and Augustus delivered the funeral oration for his grandmother. From this point on, his mother and stepfather took a more active role in raising him. Augustus then started wearing his own toga four years later and was elected to the College of Pontiffs in 47 BC. The following year, he was put in charge of the Greek games that were staged in honour of the Temple of Venus built by Julius Caesar. Augustus wanted to join Caesar's staff for his campaign in Africa, but he gave way when his mother protested him going. In 46 BC, his mother consented for him to join Caesar in Hispania, where he planned to fight the forces of Pompey. When the time came, Augustus fell ill and was unable to travel. When he had recovered, he sailed to the front, but again was unfortunate and was shipwrecked. After coming ashore with a handful of companions, he managed to cross hostile territory to reach Caesar's camp, which impressed his great uncle considerably. After that time, Caesar allowed the young Augustus to share his carriage. When they arrived back in Rome, Caesar made a new will with the Vestal Virgins, naming Augustus as the prime inheritor. When Julius Caesar was assassinated on the 15th of March 44 BC, Augustus was studying and undergoing military training in Apollonia. He rejected the advice of some army officers to take refuge with the troops in Macedonia, and instead sailed to Italy to see if he had any potential political fortunes or security. Caesar had no legitimate male children under Roman law, so he had adopted Augustus, his great nephew, making him his heir. Mark Antony later started to slander Augustus, saying that he had earned his adoption through sexual favours, though these accusations are described as political slander and are very likely to have no truth to them. After landing near Brundisium, Augustus learned the contents of Caesar's will. Only then did he decide to become Caesar's political heir, as well as heir to two thirds of his estate. Augustus could not rely on his limited amount of money to make a successful entry into the upper levels of Roman politics. After being warmly welcomed by Caesar's soldiers at Brundisium, Augustus demanded a portion of the funds that were made ready for Caesar for his intended war against the Parthians in the Middle East. A later investigation started by the Senate into the disappearance of these public funds took no action against Augustus since he also used that money to raise troops against the Senate's enemy, Mark Antony. Augustus made another move in 44 BC when, without permission, he took the annual tribute that had been sent from Rome's near eastern province to Italy. Augustus started to bolster his own personal forces with Caesar's fettering legionaries and with troops that were going to be sent for the Parthian War, gathering support by empathising his status as heir to Caesar. On his way to Rome through Italy, Augustus's presence and newly acquired funds attracted many, winning over Caesar's former veterans stationed in Campania. By June, he had gathered an army of 3,000 loyal veterans, paying each a salary of 500 denarii. Arriving in Rome on the 6th of May, Augustus found Mark Antony in an uneasy truce with Caesar's assassins. They were given a general amnesty on the 17th of March, yet Mark Antony had succeeded in driving most of them out of Rome when he spoke at Caesar's funeral. Mark Antony was getting political support, but Augustus still had time to rival him as the leading member of the faction supporting Caesar. Mark Antony had initially opposed the motion to elevate Caesar to define status. Because of this, he had lost the support of many Romans and supporters of Caesar. Augustus also tried unsuccessfully to get Mark Antony to hand over Caesar's money to him. Augustus managed to win support from sympathisers to Caesar and worked together with the former enemies of Caesar, who saw Augustus as the lesser evil and hoped to manipulate him. With the people in Rome turning against Mark Antony and his consulship coming to its end, 
he attempted to pass laws that would give him the province of Gaul. Meanwhile, Augustus built up an army in Italy by recruiting Caesar's veterans. On the 28th of November, he also won over two legions previously under the command of Mark Antony, with the enticing offer of being paid more. Because Augustus now had a large and capable force, Mark Antony saw the danger of staying in Rome, and he left for Gaul, which was handed to him on the 1st of January. However, not all went well for Antony, as the province had previously been assigned to Brutus, one of Caesar's assassins, who now refused to give up the land to Antony. He then besieged Brutus at Mutina and rejected the Senate when told to stop the fighting. This provided an opportunity for Augustus, who already was known to have his own army. At the urging of Cicero, the Senate made Augustus a senator on the 1st of January 43 BC, yet he was also given the power to vote alongside the former consuls. In addition to this, Augustus was granted commanding power which legalised the command of his troops. He then sent him to relieve the siege along with two other consuls. Mark Antony's forces were defeated both at the Battle of Forum Gallarum and Mutina, forcing Antony to retreat further into Gaul. Both consuls following Augustus were killed, however this meant that Augustus had sole command of their armies. The Senate gave many more rewards to Decimus Brutus than they did to Augustus for defeating Antony. They even attempted to give command of the consular legion to Brutus. In response, Augustus stayed in Po Valley and refused to help in any further offensive against Antony. In July, Augustus sent an embassy of centurions to enter Rome and demand that the consulship left vacant be handed to him. Also that the decree that declared Antony a public enemy should be rescinded. When they refused this, Augustus marched on the city with eight legions. He encountered no military opposition in Rome and on 19th of August 43 BC he was elected consul with his relative Quintus Pedius as co-consul. Meanwhile, Antony formed an alliance with Marcus Armelius Lepidus, another follower of Caesar. In a meeting near Bologna in October 43 BC, Augustus, Antony and Lepidus formed the second triumvirate. Their powers were made official by the Senate on the 27th of November. This arrogation of special powers which lasted five years was then legalised by law passed by the Tribune of the Pleb, unlike the first triumvirate. The three of them then started to forbid certain things, in which either 130 or 300 senators and 2,000 equites were branded as outlaws and deprived of their properties, and for those who failed to escape also their lives. This decree issued by the triumvirate was in part motivated by the need to raise money to pay the salaries of their armies for the upcoming conflict against Caesar's assassins, Marcus Junius Brutus and Gaius Cassius Longinus. Rewards for the arrest of these outlaws gave incentive for Romans to capture them, while the assets and properties of those arrested were seized by the triumvirate. It's believed that Augustus tried to avoid outlawing these officials, while Lepidas and Antony were to blame for initiating it. Cassius Dio said that Augustus wanted to spare as many as possible, whereas Antony and Lepidas, being older and having many more enemies to deal with, did not want to spare any. Although this claim was rejected by Appian, who said that Augustus shared an equal interest with Lepidas and Antony in getting rid of his enemies. On the 1st of January 42 BC, the Senate recognised Julius Caesar as a god of the Roman state, Dius Ilius. Augustus was able to take advantage of this and further his course by emphasising the fact that he was the son of the divine. Antony and Augustus then sent 28 legions by sea to face the armies of Brutus and Cassius, who had built their power up in Greece. After two battles in Macedonia, the armies of Augustus and Antony were victorious and caused both Brutus and Cassius to commit suicide. Mark Antony later used these battles as a means to insult Augustus, as both battles were mainly won with the use of Antony's forces. On top of claiming responsibility for both victories, Antony also called Augustus a coward for handing over his direct military control to Marcus Fipsanius Agrippa instead. After the battles in Macedonia, the three members of the second triumvirate made a new territorial arrangement. Augustus received the provinces of Gaul and Hispania, Antony travelled to Egypt where he allied himself with the famous Cleopatra, then Lepidas was left with the province of Africa. It was left to Augustus to decide where in Italy to settle the tens of thousands of veterans of the Macedonian campaign, of which the triumvirate had promised to discharge. The tens of thousands who were on the side of Brutus and Cassius could easily ally with a political opponent of Augustus if they were not appeased. There wasn't any more government controlled land to give a settlement for their soldiers, so Augustus was left with two options. The first option being confiscating the land of many Roman citizens, 
or he could alienate many Roman soldiers who could potentially mount a considerable opposition against him in the Roman heartland. Augustus chose the first option. There were as many as 18 Roman towns affected by this choice, with entire populations driven out or at least given partial evictions. There was widespread dissatisfaction with Augustus over the settlement of his soldiers, and this encouraged many to rally at the side of Lucius Antonius, who was brother of Mark Antony and was supported by a majority in the Senate. Meanwhile, Augustus asked for a divorce from Claudia, the daughter of Mark Antony's current wife with her first husband. He returned Claudia to her mother, claiming that their marriage had never been consummated. The mother decided to take action. Together with Lucius Antonius, she raised an army in Italy to fight for Antony's rights against Augustus. The two of them took a huge political and martial gamble in opposing Augustus, since the Roman army still depended on the Trian Wirate for their salaries. Lucius Antonius and his allies ended up in a defensive siege at Perusia, where Augustus forced them into a surrender in early 40 BC. Lucius and his army were spared due to his kinship with Antony, while the mother of Claudia was exiled. However, Augustus showed no mercy to the mass of allies loyal to Lucius. On the 15th of March, the anniversary of Julius Caesar's assassination, he had 300 Roman senators and equestrians executed for allying with Lucius. The city of Perusia was also pillaged and burned as a warning to others. This bloody event did negatively affect Augustus' reputation and was criticised by many. The son of Pompey, Septus Pompeius, was still a renegade general following Julius Caesar's victory over his father and had established himself in Sicily and Sardinia as part of an agreement made with the second Trian Wirate in 39 BC. Both Antony and Augustus wanted an alliance with Pompeius. Augustus succeeded in a temporary alliance in 40 BC when he married Scribonia, either a sister or daughter of Pompeius' father-in-law. She gave birth to Augustus' only natural child named Julia, the same day that he divorced her to marry Livia Drusilla, a little more than a year after their marriage. Mark Antony, while in Egypt, had an affair and children with Cleopatra, but was aware his relationship with Augustus was getting worse, so he sailed to Italy in 40 BC with a large force to oppose Augustus, and he laid siege to Brundisium. This conflict didn't go well for either side, as their centurions, who had become important figures themselves, refused to fight due to their Caesarian cause. The legions under their command followed suit. Meanwhile, Antony's actual wife died of a sudden illness while he was en route to meet her. Her death and the mutiny of their centurions allowed Antony and Augustus to agree to peace. Augustus and Antony approved the Treaty of Brundisium, which meant Lepidus would remain in Africa, Antony in the east, and Augustus in the west. Although the Italian peninsula was left open to all for the recruitment of soldiers. To further cement their alliance, Augustus gave Mark Antony his sister, Octavia, in marriage to Antony in late 40 BC. Sextus Pompeius threatened Augustus in Italy by denying shipments of grain through the Mediterranean Sea to the peninsula. Pompeius' own son was put in charge as naval commander in an effort to cause famine in Italy. Pompeius' control over the sea prompted him to take on the name Neptuna Filius, which means son of Neptune. The blockade on Italy was lifted once Augustus granted Pompeius Sardinia, Corsica, Sicily and the Peloponnese and assured him a future position as consul for 35 BC. The territorial agreement between the Trian Wirate and Pompeius began to fall apart once Augustus divorced Scribonia and married Livia in 38 BC. Fortunately for Augustus, one of Pompeius' naval commanders betrayed him and handed over Corsica and Sardinia to Augustus. Augustus lacked the resources to confront Pompeius alone, so an agreement was reached to extend the second Trian Wirate for another five year period, beginning in 37 BC. In return for supporting Augustus, Antony expected to gain support for his own campaign against Parthia, desiring to avenge Rome's defeat in 53 BC. They had reached an agreement that Antony would provide 120 ships for Augustus to use against Pompeius, while Augustus was meant to send 20,000 legionaries to Antony for use against Parthia. Augustus ended up only sending a tenth of those promised, which Antony viewed as an intentional insult. Augustus and Lepidus launched joint attack against Pompeius in 36 BC. Despite setbacks for Augustus, the naval fleet of Pompeius was almost entirely destroyed on the 3rd of September by his general Agrippa. Pompeius fled to the east where he was captured and executed in Miletus by one of Antony's generals the following year. As Pompeius' troops surrendered to Lepidus and Augustus, Lepidus attempted to claim Sicily for himself, ordering Augustus to leave. This didn't end well for him, his troops deserted him and defected to Augustus' side since they were tired of fighting 
and enticed by Augustus' promises of money. So Peter surrendered to Augustus and was permitted to retain the office of Pontifex Maximus, but no longer allowed to be part of the Triumvirate, effectively ending his public career. Rome was now divided between Augustus in the west and Antony in the east. Augustus ensured Rome's citizens of their rights to property in order to maintain peace and stability in his portion of the empire. During this time, he settled his discharged soldiers outside of Italy while also returning 30,000 slaves to their former Roman owners, slaves who had fled to join Pompeius. Augustus also had the Senate grant him, his wife and his sister tribunal immunity in order to ensure not only his safety, that of his family once he returned to Rome. Meanwhile, Mark Anthony's campaign against Parthia turned out to be a disaster, ruining his image as a leader, and the 2,000 legionaries sent by Augustus to Antony were hardly enough to replenish his forces. However, Cleopatra could restore his army to full strength. He was already engaged in a romantic affair with her, and so he decided to send his wife, Octavia, back to Rome. Augustus used this to spread propaganda saying that Antony was becoming less than Roman because he rejected a legitimate Roman spouse for an oriental paramour. In 36 BC, Augustus used a political ploy to make himself look less autocratic and Antony more the villain by proclaiming that the civil wars were coming to an end, that he would step down in the Triumvirate if only Antony would do the same. Antony refused. When Roman troops captured the Kingdom of Armenia in 34 BC, Antony made his son, Alexander Helios, the ruler of Armenia. He also awarded the title Queen of Kings to Cleopatra. Augustus used these acts to convince the Roman Senate that Antony had ambitions to diminish the supremacy of Rome. Augustus became consul once again on 1st of January 33 BC. He opened the following session in the Senate with an attack on Antony's grants of titles and territories to his relatives and to his queen. This breach between Antony and Augustus prompted a large portion of senators as well as both of that year's consuls to leave Rome and defect to Antony. However, Augustus received two key deserters from Antony in the autumn of 32 BC. These defectors gave Augustus the information that he needed to confirm with the senate all the accusations that he had made against Antony. Augustus forced his way into the temple of the festal virgins and seized Antony's secret will which he promptly made public. The will would have given away Roman conquered territories as kingdoms for his sons to rule, and designated Alexandria as the site for a tomb for him and his queen. In late 32 BC, the Senate officially revoked Antony's powers as consul, and declared war on Cleopatra in Egypt. In early 31 BC, Antony and Cleopatra were stationed in Greece when Augustus gained an initial victory. His navy successfully ferried troops across the Adriatic Sea under the command of Agrippa. Agrippa cut off Antony and Cleopatra's main force from their supply routes at sea, while Augustus landed on the mainland opposite the island of Corfu and marched south. They were trapped on land and sea. There were many who deserted from Antony's army and fled to Augustus' side daily. Antony's fleet sailed through the Bay of Actium on the western coast of Greece in a desperate attempt to break free of the naval blockade. It was there that Antony's fleet went up against the much larger fleet of smaller, more manoeuvrable ships under the commanders Agrippa and Gaius Sossius in the Battle of Actium on the 2nd of September 31 BC. Antony and his remaining forces only survived due to a last ditch effort by Cleopatra's fleet that had been waiting nearby. Augustus pursued them and managed to defeat their forces in Alexandria on the 1st of August 30 BC, after which Antony and Cleopatra committed suicide. Antony fell on his own sword and was taken by his soldiers back to Alexandria where he died in Cleopatra's arms. Cleopatra died soon after, either by the bite of a snake or by poison. Augustus had exploited his position as Caesar's heir to further his own political career and he was well aware of the dangers in allowing another person to do the same. He therefore followed the advice that two Caesars are one too many, ordering Caesarion, Julius Caesar's son by Cleopatra, to be killed. He also had killed Cleopatra's children for Mark Antony, excluding Antony's older son. Augustus had previously shown little mercy to surrendered enemies and acted in ways that had proven unpopular with the Roman people, yet he was given credit for pardoning many of his opponents after the Battle of Actium. After Actium and the defeat of Antony and Cleopatra, Augustus was in a position to rule the entire Roman Republic, but he had to achieve this through small power gains. He did so by courting the Senate and the people while upholding the Republican traditions of Rome, appearing that he was not aspiring to dictatorship or monarchy. 
When they marched into Rome, Augustus and Marcus Agrippa were elected as consuls by the Senate. Years of civil war had left Rome in a state of near lawlessness. The Republic was not prepared to accept the control of Augustus as a ruler. At the same time, Augustus could not simply give up his authority without risking further civil wars amongst his Roman generals. Even if he didn't desire a position of authority, his current position demanded that he look into the well-being of Rome and the Roman provinces. Augustus' aims from this point on were to return Rome to a state of stability by lifting the political pressure imposed on the courts of law and ensuring free elections, at least in name. In 27 BC, Augustus made a show of returning full power to the Roman Senate and handing over his control of the Roman provinces and their armies. However, under his consulship, the Senate had little power. Augustus was no longer in direct control of the provinces and their armies, but he retained the loyalty of active duty soldiers and veterans alike. The careers of many clients and adherents depended on his patronage, as his financial power was unrivaled in the Roman Republic. In 20 BC, he failed to encourage enough senators to finance the building and maintenance of networks of roads in Italy, so instead he undertook direct responsibility for them. This was publicised on the Roman currency issued in 16 BC, after he donated vast amounts of money to the public treasury. The Senate proposed to Augustus that he once again assume control of the provinces, as these provinces were considered chaotic. Through the Senate, Augustus was able to continue the appearance of a still-functioning constitution. Faking reluctance, he accepted a 10-year responsibility of overseeing these provinces. The provinces given to Augustus for that 10-year period included much of the conquered Roman world, including all of Hispania, Gaul, Syria, Sicilia, Cyprus and Egypt. To add to that, command of these provinces provides Augustus with control over the majority of Rome's legions. While Augustus was consul, he dispatched senators to his provinces under his command as his representatives to manage the province and ensure that his orders were carried out. The provinces not under Augustus' control were overseen by governors chosen by the Roman Senate. Augustus became the most powerful political figure within Rome and in most of its provinces, but he did not have complete political and martial power yet. The Senate still controlled North Africa, an important producer of grain, as well as Illyria and Macedonia, two important regions with several legions. However, the Senate only had control of five or six legions distributed amongst three proconsuls, compared to the 20 legions under the control of Augustus, so they could not pose any kind of challenge to Augustus. The Senate's control over some of the Roman provinces helped to maintain the Republican facade that Augustus wanted. Also, Augustus controlling entire provinces followed Republican-era precedents for the objective of securing peace. Some other prominent Romans, such as Pompey, had been granted similar military powers in times of crisis. On the 16th of January 27 BC, the Senate gave him the new title of Augustus and Princeps. A small note, Augustus is from the Latin word augury, meaning to increase. This new name was also more favourable than Romulus, the previous one which he had styled for himself in reference to the story of the founder of Rome, which symbolised a second founding of Rome. The title of Romulus was also too associated with notions of monarchy and kinship, which Augustus tried to avoid. The title Princeps Senatus originally meant the member of the Senate with the highest precedence, but in this case it became an almost regal title for a leader who was first in charge. The name Augustus was also inherited by all future emperors. As a result, some historians regard this event as the beginning of Augustus' reign as emperor. Augustus also gave himself the title Imperator Caesar Divi Filius, meaning Commander Caesar, son of the defiled one. He transformed Caesar, a cognomen for one branch of the Julian family, into a new family line that began with him. Augustus was granted the right to hang the corona, civica, or civic crown above his door and to have laurels drape his doorposts. However, he renounced openly displaying insignias of power such as holding a sceptre, wearing a crown, or even a purple toga like that of Julius Caesar. However, the Senate did award him with a golden shield displayed in the meeting hall of the Curia, bearing the inscription Virtus Pietas Clementia Aesticia, which translates to Phala, Piety, Clemency and Justice. By 23 BC, some of the unrepublican implications were becoming apparent concerning the settlement of 27 BC. Augustus' retention of an annual consulship drew attention to his dominance over the Roman political system, and that it cut in half the opportunities for others to achieve what was still the most distinguished position in the Roman state. He was also causing political problems by desiring to have his nephew, 
Marcus Claudius Marcellus follow in his footsteps and eventually assume the Principate in his turn. This did alienate his three greatest supporters, Agrippa, Mescanus, and Libya. Augustus appointed the Republican Calpurnius Piso, who had actually fought against Julius Caesar and supported Brutus as his co-consul in 23 BC. In the late spring, Augustus had a severe illness and on his supposed deathbed made arrangements that would ensure the continuation of the Principate in some form. Augustus prepared to hand down his signet ring to his favoured general Agrippa. However, Augustus handed to his co-consul Piso all of his official documents, an account of public finances and authority over listed troops in the provinces, all while Augustus' favoured nephew Marcellus came away with nothing. This was a surprise to many who believed that Augustus would have named an heir to his position as unofficial emperor. Augustus only gave properties and possessions to his designated heirs as an obvious system of imperial inheritance would have provoked resistance amongst the more republican-minded Romans. In regards to the Principate, it was obvious to Augustus that Marcellus was not ready to take on his position. By giving his signet ring to Agrippa, Augustus intended to signal to the legions that Agrippa was to be his successor and that they should continue to obey Agrippa. Soon after, his illness actually subsided and Augustus for now gave up his consulship. The only other times Augustus would serve as consul would be in the years 5 and 2 BC, both times to introduce his grandsons into public life. This was a clever ploy by Augustus, no longer serving as one of two yearly elected consuls, allowed aspiring senators a better chance to attain a consulship themselves, while also allowing Augustus to exercise wider patronage within the senatorial class. Although Augustus did resign as consul, he still decided to keep his consular power, not just in his provinces throughout the empire. This desire, as well as an event known as the Marcus Primus Affair, led to a second compromise between Augustus and the Senate, known as the Second Settlement. The primary reasons for the Second Settlement were as follows. First, after Augustus gave up his yearly consulship, he was no longer in an official position to rule the state, yet his dominant position over his Roman provinces were unchanged where he was still a proconsul. A small note, when Augustus had held the office of consul, he also had the power to intervene with the affairs of other province proconsuls throughout the empire when he deemed it necessary. Now onto the Marcus Primus affair. In late 24 or early 23 BC, the former proconsul of Macedonia, Marcus Primus, had charges brought against him for waging a war without prior approval of the Senate. He was defended by Lucius Lucinius Varro Murina, who told the trial that his client had received instructions from Augustus himself, ordering him to wage the war. Marcus Primus later testified that orders actually came from the recently deceased Marcellus. Had these orders actually been given by Augustus, it would have been considered a breach of the constitutional settlement of 27 BC, as Macedonia was still a province under the Senate and not Augustus. If true, this would have exposed Augustus and showed that he wanted to change the Republic. The situation had gotten so serious that Augustus himself appeared at the trial, even though he had not been called as a witness. Under oath, Augustus declared that he never gave the order to wage war, Marina, the man defending Marcus Primus, rudely demanded to know why Augustus had turned up to the trial. Augustus replied that he came in the public interest. Because of this, Marcus Primus was found guilty, although some of the jury did vote non-guilty, implying that they didn't believe Augustus. The second settlement was in part to avoid confusion and formalise Augustus' legal authority to intervene in the senatorial provinces. During the second settlement, Augustus was also granted the power of a tribune for life, but not the official title of tribune. Augustus was also given the immunity that is given to a tribune of the plebs. He now decided to assume the full power of a magistrate, renewed yearly, forever. This power allowed Augustus to convene the senate and people at will, and lay any business before them, to veto the actions of either the assembly or the senate, to preside over elections and to speak first at any meeting. Also included in Augustus' authority as tribune were powers usually given to the Roman censor. These included the right to supervise public morals, scrutinise laws to ensure they were in the public interest, the ability to hold a census and determine who would be allowed to become a member of the Senate. Now with the powers of a censor, Augustus appealed to the virtues of Roman patriotism by banning all clothing except the classic toga while entering the forum. The office of the Tribune of the Plebs began to lose its prestige due to Augustus' tribunal powers, so he revived its importance by making it a mandatory appointment for any plebeian desiring a praetorship. 
Augustus had been granted sole imperium within the city of Rome itself, in addition to being granted proconsular imperium marius and tribunal authority for life. Usually proconsuls lost their proconsular imperium when they crossed the Pomerium, the sacred boundary of Rome, and entered the city. But Augustus would still have power in these situations as part of his tribunal authority, but his constitutional authority within the city of Rome would be less than that of a serving consul. This means that when he was in the city, he might not actually be the person with the most authority, but thanks to his prestige, his wishes would usually be obeyed anyway. In order to fill this power vacuum, the Senate voted that Augustus' superior proconsular power should not stop when he was inside the city walls. This situation caused all of the armed forces within the city to now be under the sole authority of Augustus, whereas formerly they had been under the control of urban traitors and consuls. In addition to this, all credit for each Roman military victory after this was given to Augustus, because the majority of Rome's armies were stationed in his provinces, therefore under his control. Even more than that, if a battle was fought in a senatorial province, then Augustus' pro-councillor authority allowed him to take command, or more, credit, for any major military victory there. This meant that Augustus was the only person now able to receive a triumph, a tradition that began with Romulus, the founder of Rome. The last man outside of Augustus' family to receive a triumph was Lucius Cornelius Bulbus in 19 BC. The only other general to receive a triumph was Tiberius, Augustus' eldest stepson by Livia, for victories in Germania in 7 BC. Many of the politics behind this second settlement seem to have evaded the comprehension of the plebs, who were some of Augustus' greatest supporters and clientele. This caused them to insist upon Augustus' participation in imperial affairs from time to time. Augustus didn't stand for election as consul in 22 BC. Because of this, fears arose that he was being forced from power by the aristocratic senate. In the years 22, 21 and 19 BC, the people rioted in response, only allowing a single consul to be elected for each of those years, ensuring the other position was open for Augustus. There was also a food shortage in Rome in 22 BC, which caused panic amongst the population. Many of the plebs called for Augustus to take on the powers of dictator to personally oversee the crisis. After a theatrical display of refusal before the Senate, Augustus finally accepted the authority over Rome's supply of grain, and ended the crisis almost immediately. It was not until 8 AD that a similar food crisis prompted Augustus to establish a permanent prefect who was in charge of procuring food supplies for Rome. There were some who were concerned by the powers granted to Augustus. This came to a point where something had to be done about it when a conspiracy from Fannius Capio was discovered, which Augustus was told about from a man named Castricius. Marina, the man who defended Primus in the Marcus Primus affair, was said to also be a part of the conspiracy. With Tiberius acting as a prosecutor, the conspirators were tried in absence. The jury found them guilty, but not all agreed with the verdict. All of the accused were sentenced to death for treason and were executed as soon as they were captured, without ever giving testimony for their defence. Augustus effectively covered up the event and ensured that the facade of Republican government continued. In 19 BC, the Senate gave Augustus a form of General Consular Imperium, similar to the proconsular powers that he had received in 23 BC. Just like his Tribune authority, the consular powers were another example of gaining power from offices that he did not actually hold. He was also allowed to wear the consul's insignia in public and in front of the Senate, as well as sit in the symbolic chair between the two consuls and hold the fasces, an emblem of consular authority. Even though he technically was not a consul, Augustus had a power of one, and so the plebs' concerns were at least alleviated a bit. On 6th of March 12 BC, after the death of Lipidas, he took the position of Pontifex Maximus, the high priest of the College of the Pontiffs, the head of Roman religion. Then on the 5th of February 2 BC, Augustus was also given the title Pater Patriae, meaning father of the country. Another final reason for the second settlement was to give the Principe constitutional stability and staying power in case something had happened to Augustus. His earlier illness and the Capio conspiracy showed that the regime's existence all relied on one man, Augustus, who had several dangerous illnesses throughout his life. It was a concern that if Augustus did die from natural causes or fell victim to assassination, that Rome could be subjected to more civil wars. Now onto some war and expansion. Augustus chose Imperator to be his first name, since he wanted to make a clear connection between himself and the notion of victory, 
and became known as Imperator Caesar Divi Filius Augustus, roughly translating to Commander Augustus, son of Divine Caesar. By the year 13, Augustus had 21 occasions where his troops proclaimed Imperator as his title after a successful battle. Augustus also promoted the ideal of a superior Roman civilization with a task of ruling the world, a sentiment embodied in words that the poet Virgil attributes to a legendary ancestor of Augustus. Two Rigeri Imperio Populus Romane Memento, meaning Roman, remember by your strength to rule the earth's peoples. By the end of his reign, Augustus' armies had conquered northern Hispania, the Alpine regions of Raetia and Noricum, Illyricum, Pannonia, and had extended the borders of Africa to the east and south. Judea was also added to the province of Syria when Augustus deposed Herod Archelaus, successor to the client king Herod the Great. No military effort was needed in 25 BC when Galatea, modern day Turkey, was converted to a Roman province after the king of Galatea was killed by an avenging widow of a slain prince from Homenada. The rebellious tribes of Astorias and Cantabria in modern day Spain were quelled in 19 BC and the territory fell under the provinces of Hispania and Lusitania. This region was a major asset in funding Augustus' future military campaigns as it was rich in mineral deposits, including very rich gold deposits that could be mined. Another important victory for Rome was when they conquered the peoples of the Alps in 16 BC, since it provided a territorial buffer between Roman citizens in Italy and Rome's enemies in Germania to the north. The capture of the Alpine region also helped the next offensive in 12 BC, when Tiberius began the offensive against the Pannonian tribes of Illyricum, and his brother Nero moved against the Germanic tribes. Both of these campaigns were successful. In order to protect Rome's eastern territories from the Parthian Empire, Augustus relied on the client states of the east to act as territorial buffers and were areas that could raise their own troops for defence. To ensure the security of the empire's eastern flank, Augustus also stationed a Roman army in Syria, while his stepson Tiberius negotiated with the Parthians as Rome's diplomat. Tiberius was responsible for restoring Tigranes V to the throne of Armenia, yet his biggest achievement was negotiating with Parthia the return of Roman battle standards lost by Crassus when he invaded Parthia. Augustus used the return of these standards as propaganda symbolising the submission of Parthia to Rome. Parthia had always been a threat to Rome in the east but the real battlefront was along the Rhine and the Nubi rivers. Before his final fight with Antony, Augustus' campaigns against the tribes in Dalmatia were the first step in expanding Roman dominion to the Danube. Augustus' past illness in 23 BC brought the problem of his succession to the forefront of political issues and the public. He needed to designate an heir to his very unique position in Roman society and government in order to ensure stability. This had to be achieved in small, undramatic ways that did not stir the senatorial fears of monarchy. If someone were to succeed Augustus' power, then he would have to earn it through his own publicly proven merits. Some historians argue that Augustus was going to make his sister's son Marcellus his heir, who had been quickly married to Augustus' daughter, Julia. Other historians dispute this due to Augustus' will being read aloud to the Senate while he was seriously ill in 23 BC. This instead indicated a preference for Marcus Agrippa, Augustus' second in command, who was arguably the only one who could have controlled the legions and held the empire together. After the death of Marcellus in 23 BC, Augustus married his daughter to Agrippa. The union ended up producing five children, three sons and two daughters, Gaius Caesar, Lucius Caesar, Hispania Julia, Agrippa Pina and Agrippa Postumus. Shortly after the second settlement, Agrippa was granted a five year term of administering the eastern half of the empire, with his seat of governance stationed at Samos. This granting of power showed Augustus' favour for Agrippa, but he was also to please members of his Caesarian party by allowing one of their members to share considerable power with him. Augustus' intent to make Gaius and Lucius Caesar his heirs became clear when he adopted them as his own children. Augustus took the consulship in 5 and 2 BC so that he could personally guide them into their political careers. The two of them were also nominated for the consulship of 1 and 4 AD. Augustus also showed favour to his stepsons, Nero Claudius Drusus Germanicus and Tiberius Claudius, granting them military commands and public office. After Agrippa died in 12 BC, Tiberius was ordered to divorce his wife Vipsania Agrippina and instead marry Agrippa's widow, Augustus' daughter Julia. Drusus' marriage to Augustus' niece Antonia was considered unbreakable, whereas Vipsania was only the daughter of Agrippa from his first marriage, 
so it was considered less important. Starting in 6 BC, Tiberius shared in Augustus' tribunal powers, but not long afterwards went into retirement, reportedly wanting no further role in politics, exiling himself to Rhodes. No specific reason is known for this, though it most likely would have been a combination of reasons, including a failing marriage with Julia, as well as a sense of envy and exclusion over Augustus' apparent favouring of his grandchildren turned sons, Gaius and Lucius. Both Gaius and Lucius joined the College of Priests at an early age and were also introduced to the army in Gaul. After the early deaths of both Lucius and Gaius in 2 and 4 BC, plus the earlier death of his brother Drusus in 9 BC, Tiberius was recalled to Rome in June 4 AD. Tiberius was then adopted by Augustus on the condition that he in turn adopt his nephew Germanicus. The same year, Tiberius was granted the powers of a tribune and proconsul. Emissaries from foreign kings had to pay their respect to Tiberius. By 13 AD, he was awarded with his second triumph an equal level of imperium with that of Augustus. The only other possible heir for Augustus was Postumus Agrippa, who actually was exiled by Augustus in 7 AD and was officially disowned. In short, this is because it's believed that he was not a good person. On 19th of August 14 AD, Augustus died while visiting Nola, where his father had died. It is rumoured that Livia, Augustus' wife, caused his death by feeding him poisoned figs. Many historians view this as unlikely though and simply a fabrication made by those who favoured another heir other than Tiberius. Adding to that, Livia had also been the target of similar rumours in regards to her son, all of which are unlikely to have been true. It is also possible that Livia did supply a poison fig, but did so as a means of assisted suicide rather than murder. Augustus' health had been getting worse in the months before his death, and he had made significant preparations for a smooth transition of power, having at last settled on Tiberius as his choice of heir. Many didn't expect Augustus to return alive from Nola, but his health seemed to actually improve once there. Because of this, it has been speculated that Augustus and Livia planned together to end his life at an anticipated time in order to not endanger the transition of power over to Tiberius. Augustus's famous last words were, Have I played the part well? Then applaud as I exit. Or in Latin, Acta est fabula pladiti. This referred to the play acting and regal authority that he had put on as emperor. Though publicly, his last words were, Behold, I found Rome of clay and leave her to you of marble. An enormous funerary procession of mourners travelled with Augustus' body from Nola to Rome. On the day of his burial, all public and private businesses closed for the day. Tiberius and his son Drusus delivered the eulogy. Augustus' body was put in a coffin and cremated on a pyre close to his mausoleum and it was proclaimed that Augustus joined the company of the gods as a member of the Roman pantheon. Augustus' legacy was enormous. His reign had laid the foundations of a regime that lasted in some form for nearly 1,500 years, through the decline of the Western Roman Empire and until the fall of Constantinople in 1453. Both the name Caesar and his title Augustus became the permanent titles of all those that ruled the Roman Empire after his death. Thanks to Augustus and Julius Caesar, the name Caesar has become the word for emperor even in other countries throughout history. Just one example is the German Kaiser. Augustus had also composed an account of his achievements, the Res Getae Divi Augustae, which was inscribed in bronze in front of his mausoleum, amongst other places throughout the empire. Many consider Augustus as Rome's greatest emperor. He extended the empire's lifespan and initiated the celebrated Pax Romana, which is a roughly 200 year period of a Roman golden age. The city of Rome was utterly transformed under Augustus. He established Rome's first official police force and firefighting force. Just to note that Craxus's firefighting force was privately owned and only really served him. Augustus, now with all the civil wars at an end, created Rome's first standing army, fixed at a size of 28 legions of around 170,000 soldiers. Although his possible one existed before Augustus, he also created the Cursus Publicus, which was Rome's postal service. This was aided by his extensive buildings of roads throughout Italy. Augustus also established the Praetorian Guard in 27 BC, originally a personal bodyguard unit on the battlefield that ended up becoming an imperial guard as well as an important political force. Although he was the most powerful individual in the Roman Empire, Augustus still wanted to relate and connect with the concerns of the plebs. He achieved this through various means. In 29 BC, Augustus gave 400 sesterces each to 250,000 citizens, 
a thousand sesterces each to 120,000 veterans in the colonies, and also spent 700 million sesterces in buying land for his soldiers to settle upon. Augustus also restored 82 different temples in order to display his care for the Roman pantheon of deities. He also melted down 80 silver statues made in his likeness and in honour of him in an attempt to appear more modest. Augustus also made public revenue reforms which had a huge impact on the empire. He had brought a greater portion of the empire's land under consistent direct translation from Rome, instead of varying non-consistent tributes from each local province as his predecessors had done. This increased Rome's net revenue greatly. As some of you may know, the month of August is also named after Augustus in his honour. Until his time it was called Sextilis, named so as it was originally the sixth month in the Roman calendar, and the Latin word for six is sex. In 7 BC, Augustus reorganised the provinces of Italy and all of Roman Italy, now including the Alps, was established as a united province with the name Italia. If you know anything else about Augustus, then do feel free to tell me below. With that, this video comes to an end. So thank you everyone for watching, and if you enjoyed, remember to subscribe to my channel.